we have every reason to be optimistic that the right treatment and the right supervision can work. And what we have all the evidence uh, to demonstrate is that punishment on its own does not reduce reoffending. You know? Hello, and thanks for tuning in to the first episode of Sex, Human Rights, and CSA Prevention. This is a new podcast podcast series brought to you by Prostasia Foundation. In this series, we'll be talking to experts and stakeholder representatives about how child sexual abuse can be prevented. And we'll be doing this through a lens that is human rights focused, evidence based and sex positive. We're very fortunate to have as our very first guest, David Prescott. David is chair of the National Adolescent Perpetration Network, NAPN. He's also a fellow and past president of the Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers, ATSA, and Clinical Services Development Director for Beckett Family of Services. David, thanks for joining us. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So I've given a little bit of an introduction uh, already, but can you tell me a little bit about how and why you started working in this area? Sure. Well, I'm afraid it's rather prosaic, but it was the 1980s and I needed a job. And something kind of interesting happened in that I was asked in job interviews, would you be OK working with uh, well, the term they used with sex offenders? And I thought to myself, um, yes, of course, as part of my background in clinical social work, um, I was trained with the belief that we should work with anybody who was seeking to make their life um, a little bit better. And it was only after a period of time that people started to say things to me like, I don't know how you can work with those individuals. And, um, and so it's always uh, been an area of uh, a fascination for me. So that's um, something that I think a lot of people who work in this field um experience that the stigma, which I believe is called courtesy stigma, that not only the offenders are stigmatized, but also those who work with them. Uh, is How much of a challenge has that been in your work? Um, at various times, um, absolutely. Um, there have been many people who, um, who should have known better and who did know better that somehow assumed that I had um, some kind of dark skeleton in my closet. Um, I've also had people ask me outright uh, whether or not I got into this field um, because I myself had been abused. And um, I've often thought that, that that displayed a certain amount of ignorance um, or at least myopia on the, uh, the part of the people that asked, because many people do enter into areas of work in which they had been sensitized by life experiences. There are many wonderful drug and alcohol counselors who themselves um, are in recovery, Although I wouldn't suggest the same thing of people who have abused others going in and becoming um, uh, abuse counselors, so to speak. Um, but uh, I guess I'm, I'm trying to say that I've known many people who themselves were abused, who then became sensitized to issues around abuse, and who then became uh, developed a great range of expertise in the area, who then went on to do um, uh, uh, remarkable things based on the knowledge that they had accrued as a result of their abuse, and as a result have made contributions to the world that are head and shoulders above what they might have made otherwise. So it's always struck me, this idea, um, as you described it, of, of, um, of stigma. Um, uh, instead, uh, the, world, uh, the world really needs people who can work uh, in and around the area of abuse. So I, I have certainly gotten my uh, my share of stares and interesting comments behind my back. Mm. So you already mentioned one way in which this stigma arises is a misunderstanding, but um, what overall do you think is the single biggest misconception that ordinary people have about child sexual abuse in particular? Um, about child sexual abuse in particular is, I would say that there is a small number of people who perpetrate it in a high velocity fashion. Um, and that they can be easily identified and that they're all perverts. And all of these things uh, turn out not to be true at all. So tell me a bit more about that. What is the typical profile of a person who sexually offends against a minor? Right. Um, so in some ways, this is the good news and the bad news. I wish there was uh, an easily identified, uh, identifiable profile. Um, as we've seen in national headlines, as well as uh, of, you know, of various national news in the political arena, as well as in the criminology arena, um, people who abuse others come in all shapes and sizes and can't easily be identified 
um, by uh, by outsiders. Um, as we've seen on both sides of the political aisle, frankly, uh, very often they are leaders who are beloved to millions of people. Um, they can be celebrities and sports stars, as, as we've seen in tra- tragic uh, recent headlines, um, as well as, um, heaven help us, uh, uh, comedians um, and other people who many of us have grown up looking up to. Um, I, I don't think that there's any one particular quality that leads people to abuse, except to say that uh, on at least w- one occasion, in one time and in one place, this was a person who in that moment was willing to abuse. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they were uh, willing to do it on a number of occasions, other times only once. So as I mentioned during your introduction, you're part of an organization called the National Adolescent Perpetrator Network. Uh, Can you tell us a little more about that? How common is it for adolescents to offend and and what are the risk factors that may cause them to do so? (laughs) Sure. Um, So let me, if I could just take one step back and say, although I sometimes have an optimistic attitude and I've certainly made my peace with the, uh, the the nature of the work that I do. It's likewise just as important never, ever, ever to uh, forget the harm that sexual abuse causes uh, to various people. When you listen to me talk, you're listening to somebody that's dealt with some of the scariest individuals on the planet and at the same time have seen uh, how many, 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 many people can go on to lead perfectly ordinary and productive lives and contribute to society Um, in any number of ways. This is one reason I say that there's no profile. With respect to adolescents and the National Adolescent Perpetration Network, um, a study done by uh, David Finkelhor and his colleagues in 2009 demonstrated that out of all of the reports of sexual abuse in the United States over many, many years, one-third of those uh, incidents were perpetrated by adolescents. Um, that's, uh, that is a very significant minority. Were you about to say something, Jeremy? Well, no, I was just going to say, I don't think most people realize that it would be that high. Uh, it seems like most people assume it's like dirty old men in raincoats who, who abuse children. And, and sometimes that's not the case, is it? Precisely. Not to sound too informal, but it surprised the heck out of me as well. Uh, and so, I mean, this is a, this is a lot of kids. So, so in part we say, oh my gosh, if this if this many kids are causing this much harm, we need to do something to stop it. But but wait a minute, this challenges all of our previous uh, uh, conceptions and paradigms about who abuses. Uh, because on one hand, we we want the, the abuse to stop and we want the, the kids who are doing this to be held accountable. But on the other hand, wait a minute, once you meet a lot of these kids, you realize they, they don't even know how to be accountable for for anything. They don't know what accountability is. How do we get them to account for their actions? What are the risk factors? What did cause these kids to abuse? Now, if it is the 40-something man in his um, in his trench coat, that's one thing. But on the other hand, these are kids and they're highly dependent on their uh, on the context in which they live, their families or foster families or schools or, or wherever they are. So what are the risk factors? Well, we know that a lot of the risk factors for abuse tend to be situational in nature, um, parental supervision, um, who's, uh, who's been raising them. Uh, do they have parents that have been involved with the criminal justice system or you know, older brothers and sisters involved with the criminal justice system? Are they getting enough supervision in school, et cetera, et cetera? And on the other hand, who are these kids' peer groups? What do we know about the uh, the influences that these kids have in their life? Or in some cases, and I have to emphasize in a very small minority of cases, um, it may be that we actually are seeing a kind of early onset sexual interest in children or other kinds of sexual behaviors that if they act on them, they're going to cause harm. So the good news is that the vast majority of kids who abuse and who are caught um, don't go on to do it again. And the good news is we've learned that short-term, um, if you will, aggressive interventions like treatment and supervision can um, can actually help kids uh, change their lives, whereas more passive and long-term solutions like registration and notification and residence restrictions not only have been shown up to this point not to be effective, but can in some cases make matters worse. In other words, what kids need 
much more often than not, is guidance on how to become really good men um, and women. Um, and what they don't need is the shame and stigma of labeling and being placed on the and on an internet registry um, and these sorts of things. So we have every reason to be optimistic that the right treatment and the right supervision can work. And what we have all the evidence uh, to demonstrate is that punishment on its own does not reduce reoffending. It helps some people. It makes some people worse on average. Well, I mean, I think that's an optimistic message overall, isn't it? Because, you know, there are things that we can do. Um, and I'm going to take you back in a few minutes to some of those specific interventions that do and don't work. But just to pick up on a point of terminology, because you mentioned during your previous answer um, that there are some, probably a, a minority of um, adolescent offenders who are beginning to have a, an ongoing sexual interest in younger children. Um, is that uh, is an adolescent who offends always a pedophile, or is there only you know that small class of adolescent offenders who would eventually have that classification? Sure. So it's it's really important to make a distinction, which I'm sure many people know, but it, it bears repeating: that an interest in children is not the same thing as the behavior. M many people, adults and juveniles, have molested children. Um, not because they were sexually interested in children, but because um, this is what was available to them at the time. Um, sometimes people are mean. Uh, sometimes people are opportunistic. And so, uh, so the behavior itself may not actually speak to an ongoing, uh, if you will, died in the wool uh, sexual interest in children. And the reverse is also true, that there are many, many people who grow up to a certain age and say, uh, ask themselves, am I a monster? I have, I'm sexually attracted to children and I do not want to act on that interest. Um, what should I do? And these people very often have a very, very difficult time um, getting help because most therapists think in terms of mandatory reporting laws. So the interest is not the same thing as the behavior. People can change their sexual behaviors. I have no doubt about it and I have all the data to back it up. Um, on the other hand, I'm less, um, I'm less optimistic that people change their actual sexual interest profile. Now, there's many aspects of human sexuality that do change over time. If you look at me, you can see I have gray hair. Um, I, uh, when I was a teenager, I was attracted to uh, girls my own age. I don't think that that was deviant. I was also a teenager. Uh, now that I'm older, I'm a, I, I do find people attractive um, who were both my own age, and I don't act on that attraction because I'm married. Um, so there's attraction which exists. There's willingness to uh, to act on that attraction, um, and I think anybody who's watching this video has probably noticed people to who whom they believed were attractive, who they didn't try to have sex with, um, although perhaps a small minority have tried. I'm sorry, that's a little bit of humor mixed into this. But I want to emphasize that there's different components, the behavior, the attraction, um, and the long-term entrenched interest. Most kids do not have their sexual interest patterns firmly established yet until they're 18. It does sometimes happen down to the age of 16, um, but I would be very cautious in, in interpreting those statements. So it does sound like because there are adolescents who offend for different, very different reasons in some cases, you would need to target different sorts of interventions towards them. Um, so what are some of the different kinds of interventions that, uh, that are most promising when working with youth who have offended? Okay, well, let me, let me sort of slowly zero in on that. I think one of, the, uh, one, of the key, one of the key elements is if you can keep kids in the community and if you can involve their families you will probably get much, much further than you do when you send them off to juvenile justice institutions or residential treatment programs. I don't think there's any question about that. Kids need their families involved. And that is one of the single biggest obstacles that exists in terms of providing sort of prompt and adequate treatment. Um, however, within that, let's, let's think to ourselves that um, there are many, many, many kids who abuse and didn't want to hurt anybody, but they abuse as a result of either not having any skills to prevent abuse or whatever minimal skills they had didn't serve them very well. 
So they might have thought, ooh, I see somebody, I want to have sex, uh, so maybe I'll just look at lots of pornography and hope that the urge goes away. I mean, this is an absolutely disastrous skill uh, to try to use. And then there's a, uh, a smaller number of people who are perfectly okay with abusing and who are seeking out opportunities to, to do it. So these two categories of kids are going to need different kinds of approaches The second category of kid is going to have to um, first stop and get some education about the harm of sexual abuse and then to understand what's in it uh, for them uh, to stop abusing. The first set of kids, the ones who want to prevent abuse and lack the skills to do it, are probably going to benefit from some basic skill building. However, probably across the board, all of these kids Most kids, the vast majority of kids, are going to benefit from learning some kind of impulse control, some kind of self-management skills, um, and to reorganize their daily behavior to suit their longer-term goals of being able to have good relationships, to connect to others, and to be able to uh, demonstrate and develop independent living skills. Am I answering your question? Yeah, and I'm wondering, as you're saying this, To what extent do we have to wait until a child um, or a a young person displays problematic behaviours? And to what extent should it really be a matter of sexual education in uh, addressed to all children? Well, thank you. That that's the million dollar question uh, right there. If there's one tie that binds everybody in my field that I know of, it's we all want to develop skills at preventing abuse before it happens. So I've spent countless hours with volunteer organizations trying to develop uh, the template for helping families to prevent abuse. And that's where the real challenge is. And if there's anything I would like to say to society about this, it's parents, know where your kids are. Parents, take a real active interest in your children. Parents, don't think that it can't happen to you. Parents, take any kind of warning sign that you can seriously. Make sure that you know where your kids are. Set a curfew. Get them home on time. I don't mean being helicopter moms and dads, but what I do mean is understanding that sexual abuse exists and that it can be prevented. Understanding that it isn't the old guys in trench coats that you talked about before. Um, I'm I'm not blaming parents. I am saying parents have a really active role and a deeply honorable role, and this should be part of raising our kids, is raising our kids so that they can someday raise kids of their own. So what if the worst does happen? If you're a parent, like like I'm a parent, uh, what happens if uh, my child does behave inappropriately? Um, I don't necessarily want to see my child being exposed to the criminal justice system, or I might be scared about that. I might be worried about that. So so what should a parent do in that situation? Um, I do think um, it really depends on the case. Uh, this is, I don't mean to take the easy way out in the answer. Depending on the circumstances, the first person you might want to call could be an attorney. Um, I don't think that in any of these situations, it's a case where you should just go it alone and tell them to knock it off. Um, however, again, it, it really does depend on, on circumstances. If you're talking about an act of um, unacceptable sexual violence, um, it may need, mean that you need to reach out for help and say he's a good kid and we need to get him to, uh, to adulthood. Um, it may be that you need to ch- call the child welfare um, hotline. Um, it really depends on all of the circumstances and to what extent the kid might have been in a caretaker role at the time. There's, there's no one particularly um, easy answer. Um, on the other hand, um, in saying this, I take people's Fifth Amendment rights in the U.S., in other words, the right against self-incrimination, very, very seriously. So it may be that the first thing you want to do is provide uh, as much supervision as you can and get onto the phone. Uh, with an attorney to to talk about this has just happened. What should we do next? Um, parents have an obligation to raise their kids, and we all have a moral obligation to community safety. Mm. Um, and if we work in in the field as a, as a person who's licensed in a number of different states, there's no question what I have to do if I find out about abuse happening. I'm legally obligated to call the hotline. That's the first thing that I do. Yeah. So there's no easy answers. I wish there were. So um, earlier you mentioned about uh, 
the registration of sexual offenders and how that generally doesn't serve its purpose, although it may satisfy some people's minds uh, to feel that they're safer if there is a registry out there, but the facts of the matter may be different. Um, so not necessarily focusing on that, but just in general, what sort of changes would you like to see in the way that our society responds to child sexual abuse that could prevent more youth from offending or reoffending? Well, thank you. I, I, um, the way that I like to, to joke about it is to say, if I ever become king of the world, or better yet, when I become king of the world, um, there would be, I, I think, some immediate changes that I would like to see, although I freely admit that they can be expensive, is we need to stop locking kids up as much as we do. Um, we, need to, um, uh, we need to resort less to technological solutions like GPS bracelets, electronic monitoring, and, and things like this. What I would like to see is a, uh, if, when we're using the criminal justice system is I would like to see more probation officers and other kinds of supervising agents out in the community. I would like to see more mentorship programs, something along the lines of what Safer Society is doing in Vermont, trying to establish um, community mentors that can work with kids. I'd like to see a lot more treatment. And within those treatment programs, instead of develop, delivering one-size-fits-all treatment out of, a, out of a workbook or a manual, um, I'd like to see uh, what we call assessment-driven treatment. Kids need to get assessments done by competent professionals who really understand both um, uh, sort of youthful, uh, juvenile delinquent kinds of behaviors, if you will, as well as uh, other developmental issues and human sexuality. Um, doing these assessments um, takes quite a bit of skill. So I'd like to see assessment and treatment and mentorship and supervision in the community by concerned adults. I'd like to see much more of that and much less uh, uh, punishment or punitive um, kinds of approaches. I think the most important thing that we can do is get kids to a point where they can be solid citizens and um, as with as little punishment as possible. End of the day, bottom line, my what all of my career boils down to is punishment on its own doesn't work. Treatment can work and treatment combined with the right supervision and family involvement can work even better. So this has been a wonderful conversation. I wonder if any of our listeners want to learn more, where would you point them? Um, the, uh, some of the first places I, I would go would be uh, the Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers. That's ATSA.com, A-T-S-A. Um, I would also look at um, the website of NERI, um, N as in Nancy, E-A-R-I. It stands new. England Adolescent Research Institute. So I think that's neary.com. They have a, a, a clearinghouse, a press, um, and all kinds of things. They have, uh, there's also Safer Society. Uh, their website is safersociety.org. Um, and there is a project called Parent to Parent. So that's parent, uh, P A R E N T, to the number two parent, I believe it's .org, but if you just Google search uh, parent to parent, you could find it. Um, and from there, there's any, uh, I would go to their, um, their links and track down uh, lots of other organizations. The University at Oklahoma of Oklahoma has uh, uh, some excellent resources as well, as well, and I'm probably forgetting some, and I apologize uh, if, I, uh, if I am, but th that's where I would start. There's lots of great research uh, and resources out there. Um, it's just a Google search away. We were all born in the right century. <laughs> well, uh, the good thing is that for those who are watching this on YouTube, I'll be able to insert links into the video as you're speaking them, and they can just click and, uh, uh, and visit them. If you're listening to it as a podcast, then I'll also include the links uh, in the description of this interview. So uh, I'm just going to hand back to you for any final comments or any final messages that you'd like the listeners to go away with. If you're a parent... You have such an important and honorable role, and I'm a parent too. I know how it is. You, um, uh, uh, you do not deserve to be treated with any disrespect or shame, and any professional that treats you like that, you should have a conversation with or go and, um, and consider uh, your, uh, your rights uh, uh, from there. If you're a professional, please keep up the good work. The odds are in your favor that the kids you're working with are going to turn out okay. And if you're one of the kids um, uh, yourself, 
Um, uh, congratulations for watching this video and may you have a wonderful life. If you're a person with a sexual attraction to children and you're wondering about how best to get into treatment, I would recommend that you go to the websites of b4uact.com or ASAP. Um, I forget exactly what that stands for, but we can get the, uh, we can get the link up. There is help for everybody out there. This is a topic that's too important to be treated with disrespect and ignorance. Thank you for all you do and all the best. Thank you very much, David. And I, I appreciate this. It's been a wonderful conversation and uh, all, all the best with your future endeavors. And thank you for tuning in. We have three last requests before you go. Firstly, please subscribe to make sure that you don't miss our future episodes. Second, please share it with your friends. And finally, if you'd like to support our work, please become a member of Prostasia Foundation for as little as $5 per month. You can do that by heading to our website at prostasia.org. Thank you very much, and we'll see you again next time on sex, human rights, and CSA prevention.